Hello, my name is Brad Tito. I'm Program Manager for Communities and Local Government at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. On behalf of Governor Cuomo, welcome. This is the LED Street Lighting Academy. This is part three of a four-part four webinar series presented by NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program and the Lighting Research Center of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the nation's leading center for lighting research and education. Now, the purpose of the Academy is to focus on street lighting technology and lighting design to prepare municipal decision makers for interacting with contractors and the public. This webinar is called Planning for Success, and we'll be talking about planning, designing, installing, retrofitting, existing or new street lighting systems. We'll also hear from Jessica Waldorf of the New York Power Authority and become acquainted with NYPA's comprehensive turnkey LED streetlight conversion service and related grant opportunities. Now, converting streetlights to energy efficient LED technology is helping communities across New York to save taxpayer dollars, to provide better lighting, to reduce energy use, and improve the environment. And today, more than uh, 100 communities across the state have converted hundreds of thousands of streetlights to LED. So if you're considering an LED streetlight project, it's very likely there's a community like yours that's already saving money having converted to LED. And for more information, including video and slides from this and other webinars in this series, please visit NYSERDA's LED Street Lighting Toolkit at www.nyserda.ny.gov slash CEC. You will also find an, an interactive map where you can find nearby communities that have already converted to LED. And NYSERDA's Clean Energy Community Coordinators work on NYSERDA's behalf in every region of the state to provide technical assistance and guidance to help municipalities as they consider next steps with LED streetlights and other high-impact clean energy actions. And you can access all of these tools and resources by visiting www.nyserda.ny.gov slash CEC. Now, we're very happy to introduce Dan Fraring of LRC to kick off Planning for Success, part three of the LED Street Lighting Academy. But before I hand it over to Dan, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box in the webinar. We'll have time to take a few questions at the end of this call. This webinar is being recorded. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we're coming to you from snowy Troy, New York. Not quite as snowy as those of you to the north of us, from what I understand. So um, I am here with uh, Dr. John Bullough. Uh, John is the Director of Transportation and Safety Lighting here at the LRC, and he's going to be assisting me to go through this webinar. Um, as Brad said, we're coming to you from the LRC. Uh, we do quite a bit of work in this area as well as a lot of different areas, including the health effects of light and lighting for plants and all, all types of, of, of different areas. Uh, those of you who've been on previous calls uh, know that. We also, through this project, are offering technical assistance to cities and towns and villages in the state. So if after this webinar you have questions or you need some help uh, with uh, LED street lighting conversions, and you can contact uh, your regional coordinators and they can get you in contact with us uh, to help with that. So uh, this is the outline for what we're going to present today. First, we're going to talk about uh, performance criteria for outdoor lighting systems. So uh, what should these systems provide? We're going to talk a little bit about calculations. We're not going to get too heavy into math, but uh, talk to you about light levels and things like that. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to properly take field measurements. So if you are questioning what your current street lighting systems the uh, lighting that they're providing, as well as uh, after the uh, new system is, is provided, how can you check whether it's uh, giving you what you wanted it to. We'll talk about how to take field measurements. We'll also talk about uh, light pollution. That is uh, an issue that uh, people are, are concerned about uh, with outdoor lighting. And then uh, we'll turn it over to NYPA to talk about their uh, smart street lighting program. So right now I'm going to turn it over to John Bullo, and he is going to take us through the next uh, couple sections of the webinar. Okay, thank you, Dan. We'll start with some of the criteria for street lighting performance. Here in North America, 
um, the generally recognized organization for developing recommendations for street and roadway lighting is the Illuminating Engineering Society, or IES. And the IES does publish uh, a number of recommended practices, and the one you see uh, a picture of here is recommended practice number eight, dealing with uh, roadway as well as parking lot lighting. Um, in 2018, the IES consolidated all of its various publications on road, parking lot, residential streets, and other types of areas into a single document. And so that's uh, all found in this particular document. Uh, another guide that's commonly used by, uh, mostly by state uh, transportation departments, but also some municipal agencies, is the Roadway Lighting Design Guide. And that's published by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO. Um, the AASHTO guide actually is based directly on IES recommendations. So there's uh, a lot of similarity in these two uh, documents. And they both have recommendations for the amount of light, the uniformity of light, and uh, some measure to control for glare. It's also important uh, to note that most of the recommendations in these guides deal with what's called continuous designed lighting systems. And that's where the pole spacing uh, for a particular type of road is really optimized to meet those light level, uh, uniformity, and glare criteria. The guides don't have uh, nearly as much to say about um, lighting that may be installed on utility poles, uh, partial lighting, or retrofit lighting installations where you're using an existing pole spacing from a previous installation. Um, so I just want you to keep that in mind. It's largely continuous lighting uh, that those guides are dealing with. So a common uh, criterion for the amount of light or the level of light is illuminance. And illuminance is the amount of light that's falling on a surface. And it comes in units of lumens per square foot or foot candles. Uh, or in the metric system, it's lumens per square meter, which are called lux. And since there are 10.76 square feet in a square meter, one foot candle equals 10.76 lux. And we usually round this off to 10 lux uh, to make it much more convenient and easy to convert between foot candles and lux. So illuminance is relatively easy to measure and also relatively easier to calculate. Uh, for example, we, 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 we use what we call the inverse square law, where the illuminance equals the intensity from a light divided by the distance to that light squared. And then that quantity is multiplied by the cosine of the angle from the light, uh, as you see in the diagram. But just remember that if the distance is in feet, it, it gives you foot candles. If that distance is in meters, you would have lux. Now many and probably most streets, if they have been designed to, to meet any particular kinds of criteria, have probably been designed to meet average illuminance criteria, the average illuminance along the surface of the road. And presently, illuminance is used to specify average light levels for pedestrian areas. And that includes uh, things like sidewalks and crosswalks. And depending upon the amount of pedestrian activity, and also on the degree of separation that there is between pedestrians and vehicles, higher illuminances will be likely to be recommended when there are more pedestrians, and that's measured in the number of pedestrians per hour, uh, in a given location, um, and when, there are, when vehicles are more likely to interact with pedestrians, like in crosswalks. So in some walkways, there's actually a, a good degree of separation between the vehicle traffic and the pedestrian traffic, and you would have lower light levels in those locations because you would not expect there to be as much conflict with vehicles. Now, while illuminance is somewhat easy to understand, it's the amount of light that falls on a surface, we don't actually see illuminance. But instead, what we see is the light that reflects from an illuminated surface toward our eyes. Uh, and this is what we call luminance. It's a very similar sounding word, but it has a different meaning. And the units for luminance are in candelas per square meter. It's basically the amount of light, the intensity of light that's radiating from a surface in the direction of our eyes. 
And for the most part, nowadays, uh, lighting recommendations from the IES and from AASHTO now focus on luminance rather than illuminance for the amount of light that's needed on streets. Specifically, um, the luminance that they're referring to is uh, the pavement that's 83 meters, about 270 feet ahead of a driver. And that forms an angle about one degree down from a driver's eyes if they're sitting in a vehicle driving along a road. So this luminance uh, requirement really reflects uh, the historic emphasis of road design on vehicle traffic, especially on higher speed roads, highways, and freeways, and so on. Now the underlying calculations for roadway lighting uh, based on luminance are, are pretty complicated and generally are only going to be done in, in, a, in sort of a software package, software calculation. They require the user to specify the type of pavement. Uh, obviously asphalt or concrete will have different uh, luminances depending on how, you know, because they're different in, in reflectance. Uh, asphalt is darker than concrete. Um, and so you need to have these kinds of specifications to make sure that the lighting system provides a consistent luminance level. Now, given this very unique uh, geometry of one degree down and 83 meters ahead, it's very difficult, uh, in fact, it's not impossible to, to measure luminance in the field um, to determine if you've met those uh, luminance requirements. Now, as you might expect, different types of roads that are often classified in terms of their traffic volumes, number of vehicles per day, uh, would be recommended to have different luminances. So for example, a major road with more traffic could have nearly double the recommended luminance of a local street in a residential area that's going to have lower traffic levels. And as I mentioned, since it's not practical to measure the luminance in a roadway setting because of the, the geometries that are uh, involved and the distances, um, the luminance values can be approximated in terms of average illuminance. Um, based on the values that you see in here, whether the street is paved with asphalt or concrete. So for asphalt pavement, an average luminance of about one candela per square meter is obtained when the average illuminance is about 15 lux. On concrete pavement, the same luminance is obtained with an average illuminance of about 10 lux. So these relationships are helpful if you're trying to confirm whether your lighting comes close to meeting IES luminance recommendations. And we'll talk a little bit later on exactly how you can do those illuminance measurements. So in addition to light level, uniformity and glare are the other criteria that are found in the IES and AASHTO recommendations. So the purpose of uniformity criteria, uh, which is usually expressed as the ratio between the average and minimum luminance of the street is to make sure that there aren't any very dark areas along the street relative to the rest of the, the rest of the road. So similar to light level criteria, major roads and those with a lot of pedestrian use tend to require more uniform illumination. So they're going to try to control for those dark spots in between the street lights. While local or residential streets, like the one in the picture, are more forgiving in terms of how uniform the lighting should be. They allow a higher ratio between the average and minimum luminance of the road. Now, as I mentioned, the IES and AASHTO recommendations also include criteria for glare, because bright lights in the field of view can cause scatter in our eyes, scattered light in our eyes, that acts like, almost like looking through a veil or a haze. And that reduces the contrast of everything in the field of view and makes things less visible. And there are calculations that can allow you to determine just how bright that luminous veil is and how much it will reduce visibility. Um, but this isn't something that you can physically measure outside on the street. It's a calculation that's done as part of the design process. And it really, again, only applies to these continuous designed uh, street lighting installations. And as I mentioned, you know, the, the IES and AASHTO guidelines focus a lot on these continuous uh, street lighting systems designed specifically to have, for example, the optimal pole spacing to meet the light level 
uniformity and glare characteristics for a particular type of street. Now, in reality, that's not often what we're trying to do or even able to do in many of these uh, retrofit types of situations. In retrofit installations, we're replacing existing streetlights generally wherever they happen to be located. Uh, sometimes that includes on, on utility poles, and the locations of those poles are not determined by the lighting, uh, but really by the weight of the cables that they're carrying. Um, so the idea is we want to hopefully improve the lighting conditions, save energy, um, but use the existing locations uh, where they are found. So meeting the uniformity and glare criteria can be very difficult and sometimes next to impossible in these retrofit situations um, because, again, you have no control over the specific pole spacing. Often the goal would be to try to meet, uh, at least meet the same average illuminance as the system being replaced. Um, and in terms of glare, one thing to keep in mind is that in places like historic downtowns where more decorative kinds of streetlights are likely to be used, like the acorn fixtures that you can see in the picture here, these are usually mounted again on shorter poles, so it's important to make sure that uh, a decision to go with an aesthetic choice of a fixture design for daytime appearance doesn't result in a lot of excessive glare. Um, sometimes those types of fixtures can contain uh, lamps of relatively high wattage or light sources with relatively high wattage to, to meet specific light level criteria on the street, and it results in a pretty bright appearance that can be more glaring because those fixtures are going to be more likely to be in the line of sight. Now we'll talk a little bit about how we can at least uh, get a handle on doing some of the street lighting calculations when we're planning uh, new or retrofit uh, installations. Now, most often, these kinds of calculations are going to be done using uh, computer software, lighting calculation software, and there are a number of tools that are freely available um, on the Internet, online. One of those, uh, and illustrated here, uh, is the visual roadway tool. And so you can see an ex a portion of the, the output of that that shows a grid of points along uh, roadway lanes showing, for example, horizontal illuminances on the roadway. Another tool is the street lighting tool that comes from the Super Efficient Equipment and Appliance Deployment Initiative, SEADI, and that um, initiative is uh, um, organized by uh, a number of uh, national departments of energy, including the U.S. Department of Energy, as well as from a number of other countries. And both of these tools allow you to input information like the number of lanes that your roads have, the width of the street, um, the width of the sidewalks, if there are sidewalks present, the pole spacing, the pole height, um, and photometric data for the streetlights that you want to evaluate. Um, so manufacturers make photometric data, data files for their products, often called IES files, uh, for this type of purpose and the software can use those to determine how the light is going to be distributed along the roadway for different types of pole heights and pole spacings and so on. Now, for rough estimation purposes, you can estimate what the average illuminance would be uh, from a street lighting system if you can get a few pieces of information. Um, since street lights do, uh, over time, get dim and, and get dirty, um, we have to incorporate what's called a light loss factor into this. And typically people will assume a value of around 0.7 or 0.8, which means that after a few years, a, a lighting system that's been operating for a while might produce a 20 to 30 percent less light than it would on the day that it was installed. Now manufacturers also publish what's called a coefficient of utilization, or CU, for their uh, lighting fixtures. And this CU is an estimate of how much of the street lights illumination lumens will actually fall onto a street for a given street width. And as a rule of thumb, uh, since 30 feet is a typical uh, mounting height for a, a, a functional street light that you might find on a utility pole or a light pole, and many two-lane roads are about that wide, that corresponds to a road width of about one mounting height. 
the CU uses mounting heights rather than actual dimensions of feet or meters in uh, determining what the street width is. So that width is given in multiples of mounting height. Um, so a typical two-lane road would typically be one mounting height wide. A four-lane road would be two mounting heights wide, approximately. So CU curves, like the one on the top uh, right on this slide, have um, two actual curves. One is called a street side curve, sometimes it's labeled SS, and one curve is a house side curve, sometimes labeled HS. The street side curve gives you a sense of how much of that fixture's light falls onto a street of a given width. And so that would be the curve that you would use generally to estimate the illuminance on that uh, street from a given fixture. Now, since illuminance is lumens per area, either square feet or square meters, the equation in the red box on the bottom right uh, can be used to calculate how many lumens are hitting the road uh, from that fixture divided by the area of the road in a given street lighting installation. And this works out to average foot candles if your dimensions are in feet and lux if your dimensions are in meters. So on to a little bit now about field measurements. Some communities may want to measure their existing lighting um, to validate luminaire photometric performance, to provide a baseline for retrofit lighting to meet or exceed, or to confirm that lighting that was installed actually met the specifications to which it was engineered. Um, almost always, field measurements are going to be made using an illuminance meter like the one shown here. In this meter, you see that circular element with a white disc. That white disc is where the light actually falls to make the measurement of how much illuminance you would have. So that disc would be placed at different locations along the road um, to give you the measure of horizontal illuminance in either lux or foot candles that are falling on that road. Um, but the question now is exactly where and, and how many measurements do I need to make to have a sense of what kind of lighting I have. So it's important to make sure that there's enough resolution, that there are enough measurements so that you can calculate average and minimum light levels and so on. And so the IES recommends that for a given cycle of luminaires, so you would look at if there are only fixtures on one side of the road, you'd want to measure between uh, from one fixture to the next. If you have a staggered layout where there are fixtures kind of alternating on both sides of the road, you would still want to capture a cycle that covered uh, one luminaire to the next on the same side of the road. Um, but importantly, for a given cycle of luminaires, there should be at least 20 measurements made in each traffic lane. So what's shown in this diagram here is a single lane of traffic. And one row of measurements in a lane should be made about one quarter of the way across the lane, and the other set of measurements should be made three quarters of the way across. So each row should have at least 10 measurement points for that cycle, which are shown by the X's in this picture. And it's important to also remember the IES recommends that if those 10 points would be more than five meters apart, about 16 feet, then you would have to include more equally spaced points so that you don't have any two measurement points that are greater than five meters apart. And of course, we have to remember that if our specifications were based on luminance, we could use that conversion between illuminance and luminance that I mentioned a few slides ago to get a sense of what the approximate average luminance would be on this road according to the IES uh, recommended system for calculating that. So now I'm going to turn things back over to Dan, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, controlling for light pollution. Thank you, John. So um, as John stated, we put lighting in for safety reasons. We want to uh, make sure that pedestrians are safe and visible, and so there are specifications for how much light we need for that, uh, and that we can hopefully avoid crashes at night. So uh, as John talked about the specifications for how much light you need for that. 
Um, so lighting has a lot of positive benefits, and that's the reason uh, why uh, we light our streets and roadways and sidewalks and parking lots and, and all those areas at night. But over the last uh, number of years, people have uh, begin to think about, begun to think about uh, some potentially, if you will, negative impacts of light. And they've, they've coined the term light pollution um, to give an idea of these negative, um, potentially negative uh, aspects of light. And there are three parts, if you will, to light pollution. Uh, the first thing is sky glow. Um, the next, light trespass, and the last is glare. So this rather complicated looking diagram gives you some idea of those three elements. So sky glow is light that goes up into the sky uh, and allows, it basically can obscure your view of the sky, your view of, uh, of the night sky. People love to be able to look up, look at the stars as you would if you were on uh, the top of a mountain in the Adirondacks and there was no light around, you would have a, a beautiful view of millions of stars in the sky. Where if you were in Times Square in New York City, you would look up and you would basically see almost nothing because the scattered light from the area that you're surrounded by um, is obscuring your view of that sky. So sky glow has two components. It's direct light up into the sky, as you can see from the diagram, but it's also reflected light from the ground. So you have to think about those two components. It's not just the light from the luminaire that's sending light up, but also any reflected light that's around. Light bounces off surfaces. So if your um, surfaces are light in color, like uh, concrete or cement roadways uh, and sidewalks, that's going to reflect more light up into the sky. So you have to consider both of those uh, when you're looking at sky glow. Now light trespass um, is light that's going into areas off a site, so off a roadway or a parking area, into areas where you don't want light. So um, what most people think about this is spill light into people's windows. Uh, so if you have light that's going behind the luminaire off the roadway, uh, that light does light the sidewalk, which is probably considered a good thing, but it could go into people's windows. So when you think about cities where there is uh, a street, uh, a relatively narrow sidewalk, and then a, a home or a building that's right up against that sidewalk, that some of that light could go into people's windows. People don't like that. Um, you know, they want a, a dark room at night, so they have to buy dark, dark uh, blackout shades. They, they don't like uh, that type of thing. Also, if uh, people want to enjoy their backyards or enjoy their, um, their own property uh, without uh, light. They want to be able to go into their backyards, look up into the sky. We want to um, control that light that leaves the roadway as much as we possibly can. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why people are concerned about that uh, in the next uh, webinar. Um, there are, for example, some reasons why people want it to be dark at night for, for health reasons or reasons for their, their biological rhythms. And then finally, glare. Uh, and glare is mainly uh, when you're looking at the particular um, uh, light fixture. Uh, it's a bright source against a very dark background. If you can imagine if those street lights were on during the day, they're not glary at all. You could look right at them because the surrounding area is so bright. Um, the brightness of that source against that brighter background makes very little or no difference. However, when it is very dark at night, that source becomes very bright. So the luminance of that source against that dark background, uh, the night sky or the night surround, um, becomes very bright. And so it's usually that high angle light, and you can see in the diagram the word glare zone. Um, and it's that high angle light that people are concerned with. And John talked about veiling luminance, which is a way to calculate that. Um, when you're doing your lighting installation and you want to keep that um, to a particular recommended minimum. Um, and when you do your calculations, those um, software programs will help you uh, be able to do that. So when we think of light pollution, it's all of these three elements. It's not just the light up into the sky. Um, 
So the IES recommends a particular zone. So as John talked about, the IES has recommendations for the amount of light that should be on the roadway. Um, but they also say, well, you know, if you're in areas where we want um, more darkness at night, um, then we have to be careful. So we have uh, lighting zone zero, which would be, um, you know, you could imagine this is, um, you know, the, the top of, of a mountain in the Adirondacks. We want probably little or no light in that area. And then in very rural areas where we have zone one and so on and so forth. So um, you can look at your particular area where your city or town is or areas within your municipality and you can say, well, some of these areas are very rural. We probably want very low ambient light there. Some of them are more moderate. And then some, you know, like in the downtown area in the city, I'm not so concerned that I'm in that downtown to be able to look at the stars. I'm there because I want a vibrant space where I feel safe and I can see around me. So you would obviously want a higher ambient light level there. You're not so concerned about the light that might be in a commercial downtown at night. And so the IES has recommendations. Um, lower zones are expected to have lower light levels. So you can see in this chart to the right-hand side of your screen, um, lighting zone, well, zero has just what, you know, basically no light, no uh, electric lighting that's been put there. But when you get into lighting zone one, for example, rural areas, it says you should have one lux or that's one-tenth of a foot candle if you think uh, in the uh, American system of feet. Very low light levels. Um, and then zone two, three lux, zone three, eight lux, and zone four, uh, 15 lux or 1.5 foot candles. Um, What's very interesting with the IES is they have these recommendations for environmental zones which limit light, and then they have the recommendations for street and roadway lighting. Sometimes these are in conflict. Sometimes you might have a roadway that has a particular amount of traffic where it says, well, you know, you really should have 10 lux or 15 lux on this roadway, yet it's in zone two. It's in, it's in a relatively rural area. And they said, well, you know, you should really only have three lux. So you, you have to, to look at the roadway, look at the safety concerns, and look at the pedestrians, for example. Is this an area where there are a lot of people who will be crossing that street? And you may say, well, here safety is going to take priority um, over uh, limiting this light. So you have to make that decision yourself um, on you know, saying, okay, I want this to be, to be more safe. Now, there are other things that you can do um, that might help that is not just necessarily lighting. So there may be reflective markings that you can put um, on the pavement uh, where we know there are going to be pedestrians. There's signage uh, where, you know, especially if it's a mid-street crosswalk now, you'll often see that there's a very conspicuous sign that's placed there. Sometimes that sign might even have LEDs on it that are flashing to show the driver that in fact, okay, well, here is a crosswalk. So maybe I'm not going to put street lighting there, but I'm going to have these other ways that I can have signage or markings of some kind um, that are showing um, that this is an area where I have to be concerned for people's safety. So you can think about those things as well. There can be low mounted light on bollards uh, that might be illuminating a particular area of the street uh, where, for example, pedestrians might be. Uh, so think about other things that you can do to make the roadway safe without having to uh, put a large amount of light over, over the expanse. And we talked about um, uh, bug ratings, B-U-G, and that has nothing to do with insects. It's backlight, uplight, and glare. We talked about this on the last uh, um, webinar where we talked about luminaires and light fixtures. Um, backlight, light that goes behind the luminaire. Uplight, uh, light above the luminaire. And you can see in the diagram to the right what that means. And then G is glare or high angled light. So in these different zones, you will have 
limits on that. So when you look at a luminaire, you may say, well, this is a luminaire that I'm going to use in, in, in a zone one, a very rural area. So my uplight from that luminaire should be severely limited. It should be a, a very small percentage of light. So you can look at various products and you can say, okay, well, here is the luminaire that I'm going to choose because it has less light that's going up into the sky. So this just gives you another check on trying to limit light pollution or stray light um, uh, from these luminaires. So if I have a luminaire at the side of the roadway and I know there's no sidewalk at the edge of that road, there's really no reason for there to be any backlight at all. Now there's always going to be a little bit, um, but you'll be able to use this specification to say, okay, let's look at the percentage of backlight, how much light is going into that zone. I want to keep that very small so that uh, there isn't light going onto other people's property off that road. So all of these tools allow you to, to make decisions um, about that. So now I'm going to turn it back to Brad, um, and he's going to introduce uh, presenters from uh, the New York Power Authority who will talk about the next Sections. Great. Thanks, Dan and, and John. We really appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to quickly hand it over to Jessica Waldorf of the New York Power Authority. Thank you, Jessica. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um, and thanks to the folks from NYSERDA for organizing this webinar series and the people from the LRC, John and Dan, for giving a detailed overview of the technical considerations that should be made during design and the large amount of resources that they have available in this area. My colleague and Smart Street Lighting New York Program Manager Kevin Luteran and I are now going to give a brief overview of the services available from NIPA and some exciting new additions to the program. And with that, Dan, can you move to the next slide? So um, a lot of you, I think, on the call are aware of the program Smart Street Lighting New York. Governor's program launched in 2018 with the goal of 500,000 street lights being converted to LED by 2025. Um, you know, developed in large part due to the vast amount of savings that are available both on the energy and maintenance side to New York State's local governments and really with the goal of providing improved quality of light um, and safer communities across New York State as well as a significant um, dollar savings to those communities. And some of the services that we're going to highlight that are newer during this webinar are um, the official launch of our street lighting maintenance service and then just an update on where we're at with the Smart Cities grant program. Next. So uh, just wanted to give a brief overview of the status of the program. And um, overall, there's about a million and a half street lights in New York State, good amount of that, 400,000 in New York City that were previously converted to LED. The goal, as we mentioned, is 500,000. The projects that we have in design and construction total about 137,000 streetlights as of today. And the ones that we have in development are about another 200,000 streetlights. So those two combined um, means that we've had about 67% of our goal in less than the first two years of the program. And a lot of the reasons, you know, around that are ones that I think we're all familiar with, but really you know, communities see the opportunity for significant savings. That does vary based on utility territory and the specifics for a community. Um, that's why it's important that you know, we do give a detailed proposal up front to give them an estimate of what it would look like if it look like if they do purchase and convert their system um, going a customer-owned route versus sticking with the utilities and doing the utility conversion. A lot of the other reasons that we hear from communities is really ownership. Um, we're constantly in meetings with communities and also, you know, private industry about the technology that's coming down the road and available today in terms of advanced smart cities uh, capabilities for communities. And really, you know, um, communities owning their system gives them the opportunity to have a say in the way their street lighting system is designed and make sure that they can leverage that to add some additional benefit, benefits to their community and new services. Next slide. So this slide just gives an overview of all the different aspects of the program. We do help with the acquisition of the streetlights from the utility, and we help in a few different ways. We help on the regulatory side in advocating for some of the um, desires and benefits our customers are seeking through their conversion, trying to make the process as simple for them as possible, and making sure that their voice is heard in all the rate cases that take place across the state. 
Then we, um, and kind of looped in with that, we also can finance the acquisition of the lights from the utility. So our entire project model being a turnkey implementation model is that we will handle the project from initial inception, so when they're first thinking of it, all the way through to design and completion, and that includes carrying the cost of the project to the very end. Um, the requirements across utility territories are ever, ever so changing, and so we want to make sure that we can take care of that unknown all the way through to construction completion. Um, and then, you know, once the project's completed, they can either decide to finance with us or bond a project and we help them, you know, make those different decisions. The other thing that we've done uh, kind of related to acquisition and really procurement is we're authorized under public authority law to handle our procurement on behalf of municipalities specific to street lighting um, and that goes for any type of either energy efficiency or renewable energy project. Specific for street lighting, we already went out with a nationwide bid to procure low-cost materials on the fixtures themselves. We wanted to make sure that we got reputable manufacturers, that you know we had good products, and also that we could provide the best price possible to those communities. Um, Cobra head lighting, we have a very, very competitive price, about 30 to 40 percent less than what they could get on the market. Um, and then on our decorative lighting solutions, we have a wide variety of solutions for, from various vendors and really can meet whatever need the municipality is looking for and want to make sure that we provide them with high quality light. Even though, you know, decorative lighting is significantly more expensive, we're able to get them a good price for those solutions and make sure that it's the right fit for the community. On the design side, a lot of the stuff that the folks from the LRC highlighted um, following the IES standard and a lot of the different considerations are all things that are baked into our design process. And we want to make sure that it's interactive. Um, I think it was John that mentioned, you know, we try to, at a minimum, provide the, you know, best quality of light similar to what they have available today. But one of the benefits of going a customer-owned conversion route is that you can add and remove lighting and kind of tailor it to what makes sense for the community as it is today. There's a lot of communities where we go to and they highlight that they have nine lights that aren't even in service anymore or they're along a railway corridor that isn't even used anymore. So in those cases, you know, we have the ability to remove those lights from service if they're no longer needed and repurpose them um, in areas of the community where it'll have a bigger uh, benefit. On the construction side, we have a single point of contact during design and construction that basically acts as, you know, the advocate for the community, making sure that the design process goes smoothly, the sales um, acquisition process goes smoothly from the utility, and then on the construction side, um, having a contact that takes care of all the coordinating with the construction team in the field. Uh, we do uh, currently go out to bid for a labor either on a community basis, if they have a good amount of lights, or on a regional basis. We have a few bids that we went out for um, and leveraged a very significant quantity of lights in National Grid and ISAG territory. So in those two territories, we're able to move to construction fairly quickly, which is great. Um, and we got very good pricing from those vendors, too. Uh, about $100 less a fixture than what we thought, even better. Um, and that's why we on the labor side, we want to be able to go out to bid and leverage, you know, the best prices that we can um, for the biggest benefit. Financing, as I mentioned, is a tool. It's not something that everybody uses. I would say, you know, 90% of communities are financing with us, but from our perspective, we just have it available as a tool and want to make sure that there's always a way for a community to be able to make a project work. And then lastly, operations and maintenance services. I'm actually on this note, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and switch it to the next slide, who's going to give an overview of our um, Smart, Street Light, Smart Street Lighting New York O&M program. Next. Thanks, Jess. Um, like Jess mentioned, this is a new service that NYPA will be launching by the end of this year. We, uh, we're excited to share this with customers that utilize NYPA's full turnkey service and then is also in installing some asset controllers, which I'll get into some details on the next slide. But um, we really recognize that the, the missing piece to our turnkey service was the ongoing maintenance of a streetlight system. We're asking municipalities to purchase their, their streetlights from their local uh, utility. And so we've really developed a holistic program that will allow them to allow communities to maintain the streetlights moving forward through um, the NYPA O&M service. 
And just some, some key um, services that we're, we're including through this program is remote monitoring and troubleshooting. We're planning on having a control center that is going to be monitoring the streetlight system and trying to um, automate it as much as possible to create outage reports and share that information uh, with communities so that they have an understanding of when lights are out. And that way, if you have residents reaching out to you, you about light outages, you're already aware of the situation and we keep you up to date throughout the entire process. We are also including emergency response for our maintenance service. So if there's a light that's hit by a car in the middle of the night, um, our maintenance program is, is equipped to handle those type of responses. Um, and we also have a 24-7 call center that is able to um, take those phone calls as they come in. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned that our streetlights include asset controllers. These are devices that are insta installed on top of the streetlight where the photocell is typically installed. Um, we're using smarter devices that actually can communicate and control the streetlight. We see a lot of benefits to including these types of devices within the streetlight system. Um, one of the, the largest benefits is uh, ongoing operations and maintenance and insight into your streetlight. System. So every single light will have one of these control devices, and you can actually see the current draw um, performance and analytics of the street light of each individual street light. That really helps to streamline, you know, how how your system's performing and the maintenance program. So as part of the requirement to be part of the NIPA maintenance program, we need controllers installed on every single street light so that we can fully digitize the maintenance reporting and, and response features. So this is just an example of some of the benefits of installing asset controllers. You really get a, a comprehensive map of where each one of your light fixtures are located. And it also provides a detailed list of the type of equipment installed and the characteristics on the street light. So for instance, um, each point you can click, you can tell if it's on a wooden pole with an eight foot arm and a 75 watt luminaire. So it pro provides a lot of data and information about the streetlight system. It also allows the customers to control the light levels. So you can actually raise and lower light levels with these um, asset controllers. And that can help tweak the system in case you have residents that are complaining about overlit areas or underlit or special events. We have a lot of customers that have fireworks on the 4th of July and choose to dim the lights um, when the fireworks are going off in a park in a nearby area. So it gives a lot of controllability of the streetlight system and really uses the streetlights um, more as like a, a strategic infrastructure through the, the development and conversion of LEDs. And then finally, you can also monitor your energy consumption. Um, this is important if you have sustainability goals, although right now tariffs are based on unmetered rates. So any dimming state that you do um, is not credited to the community. That's actually something that NIPA is working on through the regulatory process to try and change in the next couple of years. So we're hoping down the road, if you start dimming your streetlights, you'll actually be able to realize those savings. Um, next slide. So the next service that Jessica mentioned is our Smart City Grant. This was launched earlier this year, and we have $7.5 million available for communities to buy down the cost of smart city technology. Um, we realized that your streetlights can be considered strategic assets and can really be used to deploy smart city technology to help improve operational efficiency and provide better services to residents. Um, our program is really centered on uh, four main categories, which I'll get into on the next slide. But the, the table that you see in the slides shows the breakdown of the grant allocation. So based on the number of streetlights in your community, um, you would be eligible to, for instance, from zero to 500, get a $20,000 base grant. But if you choose to expand the smart city technology that you want to implement, you can contribute up to an additional $40,000 and NIFA will match that $40,000. So in total, you would receive $60,000 from NIFA um, to put towards smart city technology. And like I said, that, that really leverages the streetlight system to, to provide better services for everyone in, in the area. And uh, I'll get into more of the, the technology that's available on the next slide. So, next. 
So like I mentioned, we focus on four main categories for smart city technology. Um, they fall into uh, these four categories of transportation, uh, environmental, public safety, and con connectivity. And each one of these um, categories have different technologies. So for instance, transportation has parking management, um, traffic optimization to really help with the, the transportation aspect of your community. You can also link up public transportation and, and other devices so that they have priority traveling through uh, the municipality. For environmental sensors, we can track um, rainfall, outdoor air quality, snow and ice detection, so that you can really get some insight into the different environmental aspects. Especially being in upstate New York, the snow and ice detection seems to be a, uh, a technology that a lot of people are interested in. And really the way that works is identify when roads will become slippery or icy from snowfall and then signal to deploy salt trucks in those areas. So we'd like to focus on bridges, you know, major hills or sharp corners um, so that you can effectively deploy salt trucks. And that helps reduce, you know, driving time of just following normal routines and also reduce the amount of salt needed in the community. For public safety, some of the technology we incorporate is um, license plate readers, uh, video analytics, gunshot detection. Um, and really, we, we try to create a customized approach when developing these smart city um, solutions. We want to work with all the different departments within the community to make sure that we're addressing all the needs. Um, and you know, it, through the process, we really find that some departments have different priorities and can really come together to create a holistic approach and, and solve a lot of the challenges that communities face. And then the final category is connectivity, and that falls into the area of 4G, 5G, public Wi-Fi, digital kiosks. Um, we're actually developing a white paper right now to evaluate the different business models and benefits of municip municipalities pursuing 5G and small cell um, installations. Once that white paper is completed, which should be in the next um, couple weeks, we can share that with you. That can really help create a guide uh, for you to learn better of the opportunities related to 4G and 5G. So that's just a brief overview of our Smart City Grant Program. Um, again, if there's more information that you'd like to dig into, um, please feel free to reach out to us and you can go to the next slide. I think that's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then with this, this is mine and Kevin's contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to either one of us at any time. And at this point, we'll turn it back over to Brad who's going to handle some Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Jessica and Kevin. That was a great presentation. We had a few questions come in. Uh, now, this is to LRC. Does the IES RP 8 2018 incorporate dark sky considerations, example, bug ratings? Specifically, um, it, 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 the recommendations for roadway lighting in terms of safety don't specifically deal with the bug ratings, but those documents also are basically have all been incorporated into a, a single place where you now have some of the um, additional re, you know, considerations when you have a sensitive area that may be in one of those lower environmental zones. So the IES publications now more or less have everything in one place where you can now at least say, okay, from a safety point of view, we might be saying you have a, a need for a certain amount of light, but if you need to balance that against these environmental concerns, um, you can do that in a single document. Okay. Now, I, I think this is probably more for NIPA, but what percentage of municipal electric load or costs is typically from street lighting? And then what level of savings are achieved when converted to LEDs? What's the payback period typically? Sure. So, um, for every community that we've been in, the municipal street lighting utility bill is usually the, the highest or one of the highest costs on an annual basis that a, municipal, a municipality bears. So I would say that um, it's usually like at least 30% of a municipal's annual yeah. cost the, devoted to energy. The big factor that comes into the overall energy usage is if you have like a wastewater treatment plant. Yep. Um, but typically the street lighting account is one of the largest accounts that a municipality will, will have. And then um, I mentioned during the presentation, but savings for a municipality varies depending on what utility territory they're in, what type of infrastructure they have in their municipality. Um, and the maintenance cost is usually like the biggest variable depending on, you know, what assets they have. 
but in national grid territory, we've seen usually 60 to 70 percent savings, even factoring in the most recent budget for our maintenance program. Um, and then NYSEG, usually 40 to 50 percent, and then the rest of the utility territories are in between those two ranges. Um, so it's, it's definitely a lucrative option. In terms of payback of a project, again, you know, varies based on the size and scope of the project, but we're usually under 10 years, even when we incorporate, um, you know, smart cities, technologies, and the grants from NYPA, as well as the costs. Great, and then uh, one one respondent said, "Thank you for the O and M option. Are <laughs> the O and M NIPA services available to all communities? Can a community do the conversion themselves and then just purchase the O and M services from NIPA? Do you have to be an existing NIPA customer in order to participate?" So, for the launch of the maintenance program, we are focusing on customers who use NIPA for the full turnkey service. This is because we, we will have the, the knowledge and control of the type of materials that are installed on the streetlight system, and we just want to make sure that we're, we're doing, um, we're fully aware of what was done during that conversion process, and that's how we were able to create some pricing structure around that. Uh, you know, through the actual conversion, we are constantly upgrading the wiring and arm infrastructure, so if you have rusting brackets and things, that's get, getting replaced through the whole conversion. Um, and then we also ensure that we have uh, appropriate warranties for the materials as well. Yep. Great. Great. And then can Streetlight customers get funding, and I'm assuming they're talking about incentive dollars from both the utility and NIPA? Yep, so um, the incentive from the utility is the same regardless of the conversion path that a customer chooses. So same um, incentive available from the utility for the street lights, regardless of whether they purchase and convert them or go through the utility pathway. Um, so yes, the short answer to that is you can get funding from both. Um, and then Brad, I don't know if you saw this question, but another one that's similar about the specifics of financing available. Um, but so NIPA has offered low interest rate financing for close to 30 years for energy efficiency projects. The interest rate is variable um, in our current model, resets every February. This year it's 2.35% and usually hovers around two. Um, since 2000, it's hit 4% once. We usually line up the finance term with the payback of the project and make sure that even as you're paying off the project, you still net a positive cash flow back. So say, you know, your annual payment is $12,000 um, in financing, you would still get, you know, $1,000 back even as you're paying back the project. And we can be flexible on that and really work with the municipality to, to make it work for you. The other is that um, you don't have to, you know, pay anything up front for the financing, but say, you know, in a couple years you want to buy it down or you want to pay it off, you can do that and there's no penalty. Um, it's a, you know, financing provided directly through the power authority. We will have fixed term financing available at some point in the next calendar year, um, but for now, you know, a lot of people take advantage of the flexibility that the variable financing offers. Great. Well, thank you to the New York Power Authority and the Lighting Research Center of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Please join us next time as we conclude the LED Streetlight Academy with People First, the last and final webinar in the series. For more information, including a copy of the slides and video of today's webinar, or to connect with a clean energy community coordinator, please visit www.nyserta.ny.gov slash CEC. And until then, thank you for joining and have a great rest of the day. Thanks.